thank you everyone for coming to our first scale up event, uh, Adversity into Opportunity. I think COVID and Brexit have obviously had a big impact on the world and the world of e commerce, especially over the last was 18 months now. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of change and opportunity sort of within our business to start with. So, you know, we started as a tech company um, when James Strack and myself started the business, uh, and we kind of turned into a process and ops company, partly because people, or our clients, should I say, e commerce retailers, they didn't just want um, the technology that we've built, they actually wanted the kind of help with the process and the operational side. Uh, and over the years then, since James and I packed our first order and we would literally pack it together, put it in the car, drive it to the post office, we've obviously grown a huge amount, testament to the whole team, you can see at the window, and won a lot of awards on the, on the way. But the bit I love the most, which is the reason, um, I don't want to talk about us today, I want to talk about all you guys, is the bit that really excites me is, is our clients and how we help them grow. And last week we interviewed um, Evan from Raspberry Pi, um, a company that I've, I've followed for years looking at there, and, and we had another client um, of ours, and Arthur Anderson's son from Thunderbirds, um, come in as well and talk about how they'd grown. And for me, the scale up epitomizes that aspect of how do we help our clients grow? Because actually, you know, the challenges I've faced and we've all faced in our business in how we've grown this company are very similar to the challenges our clients face. And I think today is the first of hopefully many events, and, and hands up to Jody and the team who've organized a lot of this, around a forum for our clients, our partners and followers to discuss the issues um, and highlight those successes of how we turn that adversity into opportunity. So first up, I'd like to welcome Andrew Bank um, from Shaw Pet Care to talk about how they've overcome the challenges of international. Good afternoon. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's the first time I've been out since lockdown, really, so it's nice to be in a room of three-dimensional people. Uh, as, as James introduced me, uh, my name's Andy Bank. I'm the commercial director from a business called Shaw Pet Care. We're based in, uh, in Cambridge, and we've known these guys for a long time. So uh, I'm just going to explain who we are, where we've come from, the challenges we've had, how these guys have helped us, and, uh, and what the what we're current, the, the current challenges that we're facing. Um, I thought this, this was fitting because what success has driven James's business forward and our business forward is product market fit. And essentially, their business and our business, and I'm sure many of yours, uh, are, in, are in a place where you've been able to offer your customer base something that really sets sets you apart from the competition. And, and that's clear in, in the development that James's business has seen, and, uh, and certainly in ours as well. Our business started because of Flipper. So Flipper, here on the left-hand side, born in 2001, was uh, Dr. Nick Hill's cat. So Nick was a, a colleague of mine in a former business in a, in a, patent, a, a technology patenting and licensing business in the audio industry. Nick went to uh, Oxford University and did a PhD at Cambridge. He's got you know a brain the size of a planet, um, and he had a universal problem with his cat. So I'm sure there are many of you who own cats, and you have cat flaps. And if you roll back to the early 2000s or even into the 1970s, you'd have a, a, a very cheap and nasty plastic cat flap in the door, and uh, your cat could go out. Any other cat could come in. And that was the problem that Nick experienced with Flipper. Um, and in the early 2000s, he decided, OK, well, how, how, how am I going to solve this problem? So he, he upgraded. He bought himself the, uh, the next best thing, which was a, a magnetic collar. Magnet sits on the cat's collar. And, and it, uh, there's a steel plate inside the cat flap in the door. And it opens up. But again, if your neighbor's got the same device, then their cat can come in as well. So he said, well, Clearly, there has to be a better solution. My cat's microchipped. Why hasn't someone developed a microchip cat flap? Well, probably they have. So he goes looking online. And uh, in 2004, 2005, there was nothing. He did some patent searches, found that there were some patents, but nobody ever made one. So he decided, right, I'm going to remortgage the house and scale down what he was doing at the business we used to work in and spent a few years teaching himself electronics, developed a completely new RFID technology, patented that, set up a business called, um, I guess in the same way as you, decided that 
was going to design the technology and then and then license it or do something else with it. So he developed the technology, built a cat flap, went to the biggest cat flap manufacturer in the world and said, will you license this? And they said, no, we're, we're not interested. Uh, so he thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to throw away four years of work when I know that this is a, is a great product. Uh, so he spent some more money, tore it up in China. And in 2008, I joined him. Uh, much to my uh, mother-in-law's, uh, she thought it was crazy because I basically said, this guy that I know, he started a business making microchip cat flaps and uh, he can't pay us for six months and he needs me to invest about 10 grand in the business to buy some stock. Um, but luckily my wife also knew Nick and said, okay, let's go for it. And, and the journey began. So it was really just the two of us for a few years working from home, much like James and James, you know, there's the smart guy in the background and then the affable person up front dealing with the customers. So, you know, that's uh, the synergy there. Um, we applied for some, we went for some uh, uh, investment money, uh, got nothing. Again, people thought we were pretty, well, the idea had no legs, um, but we had product market fit because as soon as we launched the product, um, the business started to fly. So back to our distribution model, we're talking about distribution. Well, how, how are we doing it back in the early 2000s? Well, we made some product in China. We had a distributor who would buy 20 foot containers of products and they said, we'll bring them in straight from the port. You don't need a warehouse. You don't need anything. Trust us, it'll be fine. Uh, they then sold it to uh, veterinary wholesalers, then to vet practices, and then to pet owners. So this is great. This is great. Uncontrolled distribution, not good. Early 2009, we had people who we had no idea who they were, who were selling our products on Amazon, they were selling it on eBay, uh, they were even selling it on TradeMe, which is a New Zealand equivalent of, of eBay. And we had people in far flung corners of the world saying, uh, I bought this product, but it doesn't work. Uh, can you send me a replacement? Can you help me fix it? Uh, so we had to kindly say, well, I think you need to go back to the person you bought it from and, uh, and, and deal with them. At the same time, we had uh, awards for, for best in class product, best new pet product. Uh, so we, we then got the likes of Pets Corner, Pets at Home, Zoo Plus, who are the, the, the Europe's largest pet online retailer, knocking on our door saying we want some products. But if you go back to the previous slide, all we were planning on doing was bringing in 20 foot containers of product from China and uh, had no way of supplying these people. So then we had to go down the path of finding a distribution partner. And uh, unfortunately, your business hadn't started then. Um, so we spent about three years uh, dealing with the kind of people that you were focusing on when you developed your business and all the problems that they had. So if we had a, a, a missed order to a customer, you'd just have to phone them up and, and they'd spend half an hour phoning around and then they'd get back to you. The customer experience was terrible. Over the following years, uh, we, you know, 2009 onwards, we started to expand the business uh, throughout Europe and the rest of the world set up businesses in New Zealand because there was a clear appetite for the products over there and had help from UKTI and the New Zealand government for that. Found an exceptionally good partner in the USA called Export Action, who have helped us set up a business in the USA. Uh, so if there's anyone who wants to do a similar kind of thing in the USA, they're still working for us. They do our customer service, they're fabulous. Uh, Australia was a bit more challenging, lots of hoops to jump through, uh, but the, uh, the biggest help were the bank. Um, um, so because we had the relationship with the bank in New Zealand, I spoke to the guy there and said, we really need some help getting going in Australia. Don't worry, Don't worry I'll hook you up with the right people. So uh, um, I've got to say that my dad was actually helping me doing, doing the accounts way back when. Um, and he said he just helped us out from about 2008 onwards. By the time we set up the business in New Zealand, he was actually on holiday with my mum in New Zealand for six weeks. When he came back, we told him we'd set up this other business. And he went, all right, son, time for you to find a professional to help you because um, the, the bank statement's now 26 pages long and you've got all these purchase orders and production things going. But it's just, you know, way beyond me. 
<clears throat> I looked through my old emails, James. <laughs> um, and actually, in two days' time, it's the, uh, the ninth anniversary of our first meeting. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been a seamless relationship, to be perfectly honest. We've got many distribution partners around the world. I mean, we don't have to, we don't have to speak very much. I don't think any of my team really have to contact you guys. The, the platform is, is fabulous. Um, I, I assume a lot of people here are existing customers. I, I don't know what the mix is. It's a bit of a mix. A bit of a mix, okay. Well, if you're existing customers, you know what I mean. If you're not, then, then you, you should find out for yourselves. Um, um, if we roll on, we've gone to 2015. There's lots of stuff that's been going on since then. We've launched a number of new products based on customer demand. You know, the, the, the regular cat flap, people wanted one that scanned both ways. I've got kittens I don't want to let outside. My elderly cat, don't want that to go outside. Breeders, expensive cats, so we have one that goes scanning both ways, then, oh, I've got a really fat cat, it's too small. Okay, we'll make a bigger one. I've got a main coon, it's huge. Okay, we'll make a bigger one for that. And then we made a feeder um, and, and a succession of other products uh, along the line. And we piqued the interest of a number of people and 2015, we were acquired by a company called Allflex. They're the world leader in animal identification. If you see a near tag in an animal in a field in the UK or around the world, I think it's probably something like 80% of the world market that, that they, they own. Um, and RFID, radio frequency ear tags, that's what we do. We're a, we're a microchip company. They're, they're a huge manufacturer of microchips. And they heavily invested in our, in our R&D. They've got um, other businesses within the group who've helped us develop products, and they've improved our business processes. And this was all part of a, a bigger plan to um, to, to grow the business to the point that in 2019, we were acquired by MSD Animal Health. So we are now part of Merck Animal Health Intelligence, and Merck are one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. So they're a big human pharma company, a big animal health company, and we are developing products that enable people to have stronger connections and closer ties with their animals. And uh, I'll just show you, this is just a, a video that kind of shows you the product portfolio and what we're, what we're at about. We are reimagining pet care using technology to help millions of pets and owners find new ways to live happier, healthier lives together. We work with experts in veterinary medicine to change the way we feed, hydrate, and exercise our pets, providing personalized insights for a deeper understanding of their well-being, giving peace of mind and making time for the moments that matter. We continue to explore how combining medicine and technology will drive advances in animal care, including pet safety, identification, and reunification, resulting in happy, healthy pets today, tomorrow, and for many tomorrows to come. Stronger connections, longer lives, more love. Sure Pet Care. I should have asked, has, has, has anyone got one of our products? Just one, two? How many of you have got cats? Just the three? Right, okay, so, so you're, you're a potential customer. Okay. Um, come speak to me afterwards, I'll give you a discount. Or would you just take one from the warehouse, can't we change? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, all right, everyone help yourself. Um, so, uh, Short Pet Care in 2021, just to explain. So the Short Pet Care name lives on. That's been adopted as the kind of umbrella brand for uh, microchip pet identification across the globe. Home Again is a, it's a, a large business unit in America where if, uh, if, if you, you pay a, a yearly subscription and your, your animal's microchipped, it's on a database, there's something like uh, two and a half million people who are on the on the home again app so if your animal's lost um people on that app get an alert and they've reunited about three million uh dogs in america and it, irrespective of whether they turned up you know hundreds of miles away uh it's cut the, the cost is covered for the dog being reunited that's a service that is going to be rolled out in canada uh and into the into the uk and, and other markets in the next few years and then we've got the what was the original short pet care business, which is the, the basically the, the, the tech side 
uh, of the business. Um, one of the, the really smart microchip inventions that we've got is, uh, or products, is, uh, is thermochip. So uh, any of you who's got an animal, if you've ever taken it to the vet, you may have seen the vet want to take the animal's temperature. That's usually done by lifting their tail up and uh, sliding a thermometer up the bump, which is uh, you know slightly unpleasant for the for the animal. We have a, a thermochip. So the thermochip sits under the under the, the skin in the back of the neck, and we have a scanner which reads that. So the vet has the scanner. We have the ability with the products to read that. So if you've got one of our cat flaps, one of our feeders in time, that product every time it's used will be reading the temperature and informing informing people of changes in in the animals uh, in, in in the in their well-being and then it, this can be a precursor to to, to needing some uh, some medical attention and uh, in, in, again in time will be hooked up to, to vet practice management systems and you'll see in the video um, that we've got a whole range of app connected products now. So we've got the short pet care app, so we've got the feeder, the pet door, uh, Falacqua, which is a new product, which is a, a hydration station. So again, we're just looking at all of these different touch points in an animal's life, which will help us improve the animal's well-being and, and care for that particular animal. Uh, Brexit, my God, it's has been a nightmare um, for, for all of us. So where are we now? Well, uh, I know that you guys, a lot of our business is, uh, is with, with Amazon uh, and people like Pets at Home and Argos, as well as some direct-to-consumer business. So James and James have helped us for years with our direct-to-consumer business our warranty replacement business, our spare parts business. Um, but a lot of what we do is moving, you know, pallet loads of product through these, these big retailers. So that continues to be done by our, uh, our importer who we use who are based up in the fence. Um, but the UK business is, uh, you know, it's obviously contracted for you guys, hasn't it? From, from, from what we, from what we uh, have, to, have to offer you in terms of what we've seen over the last 12 months is that during lockdown, pet adoption has gone up. And now, uh, although there was a dip slightly, our sales continue to grow. Um, word of mouth, uh, online uh, marketing has, has again helped us continue to grow the business. Where are we at post Brexit in the EU? Well, we are lucky enough to be part of a large organization which has uh, a business unit in Germany. Um, who've kind of dug us out of a hole. Uh, and unfortunately, you guys, well, I think we had discussions the back end of the last year saying, what are you doing? Well, what are you doing? Well, we're not sure what we're doing. We're kind of planning for the future, but none of us thought it was gonna be as bad as it was. So, so we scrabbled around and, and we found the German fulfillment partner. And it feels like we've gone back about 10 years um, um, they, they, they didn't do a number on us. I, I just think we had an expectation that what, what, that they would be you know, somewhat further on than they are. So we've effectively helped to bring them up closer to your level in terms of the experience that we need um, because our customer service agents have just had a terrible time chasing down orders, understanding where things have gone, uh, shipping information, not being on the invoices right, so things... Um, Things end up being left in wrong locations, and customers aren't messaged uh, what's going on. Um, but in order for us to do our business now, uh, we're having to bring products into. So up until now, we're still bringing all of our products into the UK, then it goes back out from our warehouse in the Fens, gets imported by our German partner, and then goes into. Uh, is effectively transferred back to us when it's in the German film warehouse, and then it goes off to all of our European partners. Which is, which is working quite well. I know we need to have a discussion about what you can do for us um, in, your, in your operation in the Netherlands. Um, there's a few other things we clearly have to do, back registration in Germany, that was already done, but we've had to do that in a number of other countries. Uh, again, because of the scale of the business, we've already got an authorised EU representative for the product and for compliance, which is critical um, and a challenge for, for many people. 
and also uh, we'd already set up quite a bit of this already but compliance with local recycling schemes if you're delivering direct to end consumers then you're responsible for reporting the weight of the product any hazardous materials and, uh, and plastics etc um, so yeah it continues to be a challenge we've got excessive spreadsheets trying to manage how much stock we're bringing from China to Germany to the UK to here there and everywhere at the same time our business is commercially expanding across the globe and at the same time we've got massive component shortages uh, facing us from uh, from China so yeah we thought last year was bad but this year uh, it's just uh, continuing to uh, be burdensome um, I, I just Again, I wasn't sure who was here and, and, and what we should be, you know, covering. But I just wanted to kind of make sure that I mentioned these things because I was thinking about what's important for, for, for us and, and what are the things that perhaps we missed early on. Um, and uh, you know, product compliance is, is something that that well, I guess we didn't know enough about. But it's a massive it's a massive challenge. The rules are continually changing. We've got somebody in in-house now who, who manages that um, but it varies from country to country we've started doing some business with Russia real pain real pain for us um, but these are you know I guess these are the fun bits that we need to for, for, for the expansion and that was you know back in the good old days when I went to Australia and had some fun on the beach with our company mascot um, what's really driven us forward is the fact that we've got this product market fit globally. The cat flaps have limited uh, appeal in America. They've got a huge number of indoor cats. Uh, in Asia, people don't let their cats outdoors, and if they did, they'd fall off the balcony of their apartment building. Um, and uh, um, look, if you've, you've seen the quality of our videos, we do everything in-house, uh, um, which amazes the, the wider organization because they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on agencies to do all of these ads. You know, they'll spend a hundred thousand pounds for, for an email campaign, for you know, that can pay for, for two people to do amazing things. Um, we've got Salesforce, again, that was a great investment in the business. Uh, the fulfillment partners are fabulous. Um, we've got a very, a very good, strong global logistics partner and some, some great customers uh, and uh, some, I'm sure I'd like to think if, if, if you're if you're happy with your short flat product, uh, I'm sure you've told people how great it is. That's that's what's kind of pushing the pushing the business forward. Uh, so this is really just to say, you know, thanks to all the heroes in the room. I know there are some people who are going to talk about um, all the other other things you need to to help you be a success in uh, in trading internationally. But um, James, you've been a hero to our business. Uh, I wish you continued success in what you do. So thanks very much. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks very much, Andy. Great to hear the story. And lots of challenges there by the sound of it in going outside Brexit. Uh, and obviously, some things to go to. And we're going to come on to that with the panel a little bit later, discussing kind of what are the challenges as we try and navigate Brexit. And the other thing that comes from that for me, which is story I see a lot with companies that have started and someone's garaged with an idea of their own is you forget just how long it takes before you see the grand success and you see the excitement later but there's that really you know someone's put their mortgage their house on the line for that part and none more so is that story evident um, than Hannah Silito is joining us next from uh, Dragon's Den which really takes a story of a cottage industry quite literally uh, and explodes it onto the big screen so if you could welcome uh, Hannah Silito to the stage thank you the second time I've been allowed out of the office this year so this is very exciting and it's really nice to see everybody. I'm often asked whether or not I get nervous at these events talking to rooms full of people but I don't think anything is as nerve-wracking as looking Deborah Meaden in the eye and asking for, <laughs> for £60,000. That was uh, quite a scary moment. So I was on Dragon's Den two years ago now which feels crazy. I can't believe so much time has passed but actually my story started long, long, long before that. And as James said, you know, an overnight success is often years in the planning and in the making. 
And my business started off not as a business at all, but actually as a, as a personal journey. And you sort of hear those kind of cheesy lines on Dragon's Den all the time, but it really was this personal experience of mine. So I often think I should bring the pictures along, but they're quite shocking. When I was a teenager, I developed really bad eczema and psoriasis. I certainly wouldn't have been stood here talking to you in a, a short sleeve dress and bare legs. And I got to the stage throughout my 20s where my skin got so bad that the doctors had me on a cycle of steroid creams and coal tar shampoos and greasy emollients. For anybody that's had a skin problem or has got children with a skin problem or family members or friends with a skin problem, you'll know how much it impacts so many different aspects of somebody's life. So for me, this wasn't just the skin problem itself. It was my social life, you know, dating. Nobody wants to go out dating when, you, you know, your skin feels itchy and horrible and flaky. It really affected lots of different aspects. I couldn't go to work often because my skin was so painful. I hated the feeling of the clothes against my skin. And probably seven years ago now, I went back to my doctor. My skin had flared up so badly that I really couldn't go to work. I couldn't go out. And I said, the steroid creams are not doing anything. It's not having an impact, so I need something different. And he suggested a, a medication called methotrexate. Methotrexate is a chemotherapy drug. So sitting in your doctor's office, being told that you need cancer medication to cure a skin condition is quite the wake-up call. And the intention was to suppress my immune system, and that in turn would suppress the, the autoimmune response and would temporarily, because they weren't promising this as a cure, make the skin condition go away. And I really had to go away and think about it because although it's quite a dramatic thing to be offered, I was still in a situation where, you know, I couldn't face going to work. I remember having to go to a meeting in London and getting on the train, applying greasy emollients to my tummy, wrapping myself in cling film, putting a shirt on and going to work. And my friend Rachel saying, oh my gosh, you've lost weight. <laughs> I was like, no, I just can't breathe because I've got this cling film wrap on. So yeah, it really did affect so many different parts of my life, but medication was just not a route I wanted to go down. Applying steroid creams is one thing, but you know, cancer drugs is a whole other level. But I knew that I had to do something. So I went online and I started researching, and actually I hadn't researched for a long time. So the last time that I'd looked online to see if there was an answer or a cure, there were like five people in an AOL chat room talking about psoriasis, and this was back in the 90s. And all of a sudden I went back online to have a look and there was this whole wealth of information and people talking about changing their diets. Well, my doctor had always told me that diet made no difference. And when you're struggling with a skin condition that's affecting enough of your life already, the last thing you want to do is start quitting alcohol and quitting junk food. And that was kind of my comfort. So that wasn't a route that I really wanted to go down. And I think my doctor saying that it wouldn't impact my skin just made me lazy and made me, I guess it was an even, even less of an incentive to bother making those changes to my diet. I started reading these stories online, and you can see in the picture, drinking my green juice, I came across the stories of Joe Cross and Jason Vale, and these guys are like really big into juicing, cold pressing spinach and apples, and this was a whole new world to me, but I said, do you know what, I'm going to give it a go for 28 days, I will completely change my lifestyle, no more alcohol, and I liked my alcohol, no more pizzas, no more junk food, for 28 days, and I'm going to start drinking the green juice, I'm going to eat salads, and keep meals very light. And after 28 days, I went out in short sleeves for the first time in years and nobody said anything. Nobody commented because my skin had healed to such an extent that you actually couldn't tell that I had a skin problem. And this is a month after a doctor had offered me a cancer medication to do the same thing. So 20 years of steroids have never achieved this. And it really opened my eyes to actually how much of what we eat can affect us. I mean, we've all heard you are what you eat, but a doctor telling you for 20 years that it wouldn't make a difference, yeah, it was just really eye-opening for me that actually this was it. You know, this really had completely changed my life. And I started sharing my story in an online blog. And then I started getting messages from people all around the world. And actually, there's three girls featured in my book. And they were the first three people to get in touch with me. One girl was in Oxford, one girl was in Sweden, and one girl was in Malaysia. And they sent me their pictures and said, we've seen the same difference in a month from making these changes. And eventually my blog became my book radio, which has now sold 40,000 copies, which is crazy. And we've translated into Spanish, French, and Hungarian. So the book came about because I just had friends saying, you know, this is a miracle. They'd obviously seen me struggling with my skin for a long time. 
and they said this is a story that really needs to be shared on a wider level so I wrote a book as you do I kind of put all the information that was in my head down on paper and then googled how to publish a book because I really had no idea and there's obviously two options to go now to get a publisher or to self-publish and so I thought well I'll just email some publishers how difficult can it be and then it says online actually that's not the route you go down you need to get yourself an agent so I thought, okay, I'll email some agents. And it said online, you know, you generally need to wait four to six weeks for anyone to reply because they're very busy. And I just don't really have much patience. But I sent these emails out. And within a few days, I had three different agents ring to say they were really interested in publishing the book. So I thought, this is a story that people are excited to share. And I worked with one particular agent. And she said, we need to be patient when it comes to publishers. And you need to give them six to eight weeks to get back to us. And again, I was like, I've got no patience, I just want to get this book out there. And actually, the publishers came back to us really quickly, and it's published with Kyle Octopus, who are a London publisher. So they created this really beautiful book, and it's this gorgeous sort of hardback, highly illustrated, lots of photographs, and I wanted it to be a book that people who are struggling with their skin would be proud of, so not something that sort of gets squirreled away at the back of the bookshelf because they're embarrassed. I wanted something that could sit on the kitchen table and they would be proud to to share it with people. And that's what we created. And the Daily Mail ran my story a few times and that always kind of bumps things up. So out of six million books on Amazon, we got to number two. Joe Wicks was at number one and number three. So I was like a Joe Wicks sandwich. <laughs> and um, But it was really exciting to kind of watch it go from, you know, sitting somewhere at 200 and something thousand to creeping up and up and up over the course of the day. It just goes to show the power of the mainstream press and then for it to be at number two in the charts. So it is classed as an Amazon bestseller, which is great. And like I say, 40,000 copies. But being an author definitely does not make you any money. And it wasn't the reason I ever wrote the book in the first place. You know, this was like a real personal story and a passion and something that I felt I had to get the message out there. And at the time I was running a furniture company. So we were manufacturing furniture in China, bringing it across and selling it online. And I was quite enjoying that, I was making good money. I had no real passion for furniture, but I quite liked the look of some of the stuff we sold and it was okay as a business, ticked along, made decent money. Um, but this was my passion, except this didn't make me money. You know, royalties of like 90 pence per book <laughs> isn't gonna, is not gonna, gonna serve you well, especially, you know, I say it sold 40,000 copies, but that's over the course of seven years. So it's taken a long time to kind of get there. So I just thought, what else can I do that can, that can ensure that I can spend all my time focused on this aspect of my life rather than working on the furniture. And I started looking at natural products to put topically on your skin, because as well as changing what I'd eaten, I'd started using coconut oil, dead sea salts, I'd kind of ditched all the greasy petroleum-based creams and had switched to really natural products. And I began working with a local naturopath and aromatherapist, and we created this really kind of small range just for myself, but also other people were asking, you know, what do you apply to your skin? And suddenly I had something that I could say, this is what I'm using. And, you know, I'm finding that it's not adding any problems, adding any toxins. It's just a nice natural product to use. And so I remember they were making maybe in batches of like 20 bottles of shampoo, which we'd sell each month. And on a Friday, I would pack the boxes of the hair care products and the skincare products, lug them down to the post office in two big IKEA bags. And I live in a very small village in Derbyshire, so you can imagine how delighted the post office were when I used to kind of cram the door open and cart my bags in and everyone's waiting for their pension and rolling their eyes because I'm sort of going, oh, I think this is going to Germany and this one going to America and having to fill out customs declarations. And that kind of went on for, yeah, for quite a few months. It was paying enough to cover the mortgage, but that was about it. And then a friend suggested going on Dragon's Den. And I watched Dragon's Den, and I love the show, but I wasn't sure if I could do that and stand up in front of those five dragons and ask them for any money. In the end, I applied for the show, and the first year I went and got an audition, and they turned me down. They said, it's too early in your business. We haven't really got any financial figures, and we don't feel you're at the stage to go for it. And I remember my parents being really frustrated on my behalf and saying, there's been some terrible people pitching on there this year and you would have been a lot better. But I always think that timings of these things happen for a reason. So I was absolutely fine with not going on, not to mention the fact that I was nervous about getting a place anyway. 
And then the following year, they actually asked me, they've been following my Instagram account, which had grown, watched the business grow, and they asked me if I'd like to go back and audition, which I did, and then got told, yep, you've been successful, you've got a place to uh, pitch in front of the dragons. And yeah, that's, that was a, a crazy experience. Sitting in the car park at six o'clock in the morning, waiting to go in, thinking, should I do this, should I not? Because I thought, you know, they really tear people apart. And ultimately, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a dietitian, I'm not, I'm not an aromatherapist, I'm not a naturopath, I'm just a girl with a story. But by this stage, you can see Tej holding my skincare products there. By this stage, because I knew I was getting the audition, I'd already started working with a much bigger skincare manufacturer. And actually, we created this amazing range of products. And sitting with that skincare manufacturer who put so much faith and trust in me, because they helped me do all this for nothing, they helped me develop this entire range on the basis that I was getting this audition and they had every faith in me. And yeah, it was an amazing process, sitting in a, a room with scientists sort of saying, I love a product that really soothes irritated eczema. And them saying, well, we've got these ingredients and this is a natural alternative to steroids and this could work. And then sort of saying, yeah, and, and my scalp used to be really itchy and them saying we could develop an oil and this is how we could do it. And it was just like having this amazing opportunity to work with these experts. And that's what we did, created this range. There was a lot of pressure creating that range because we didn't have long before I was due to be on the show. And it was delivered to me just two days before. I was literally sticking those labels on. And I thought, if I don't get those labels 100% straight, Peter Jones is gonna absolutely shred me to bits. So I was carefully sticking these labels on. And we had the products ready just two days before the show. And then pitched to the dragons and yeah there's a lot of a lot of interesting things about dragon's den that i find not everybody knows so the lift isn't a lift which i was like what <laughs> when i walked in i was like what no no you just walk in and then it opens and walk out the other side <laughs> it doesn't go up and down so oh and the other thing is how long you're in there so the bit that you see on tv when you're in there for 10 minutes the reality is two hours but actually the producers had said to me, the longer it goes on for, the more chance you've got of getting investment. So I was thinking, you know, as the sort of minutes tick by, I'm thinking, this is good, they're asking me questions. Um, and they are really ruthless. They really do absolutely sort of uh, go into the ins and outs of every part of your business and your business plan. But I was really fortunate. All five dragons offered me investment, which is quite unusual in the den and not something we practiced. So I'd sat and practiced with my accountant, practiced with friends and family. That was a scenario I kind of wasn't prepared for. And I'd said beforehand, I'm not gonna be that idiot that goes and stands and talks to the wall on my own. And of course, as soon as Deborah said, do you wanna to talk to the wall? I was like, yep, 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 that's me off. <laughs> and I just stood there thinking, oh my gosh. And then you're looking at this brick wall and I could see these little hidden camera lenses in the wall and I'm thinking, they're watching me even here. And yeah, I was so nervous. But it was amazing, and I, I chose Tej and Peter, who have been fantastic. And just as, as we sort of approached this stage, I knew that I couldn't turn up at my local post office with the amount of orders that I was gonna get on the night of Dragon's Day. You're talking three and a half million viewers. And I thought, even if just a small percentage of those people buy something from me, the local post office is gonna turn me away if I turn up with these orders. So I sourced a fulfillment center, and I had no idea what I was doing. So again, I Google searched it, fulfillment center, and I came up with a, a, a number of options in London. That's just what happened to come up at the top of Google. Rang a few of them, spoke to them, got some very good sales pitches and went to meet one of them. And it looked good, you know, it looked good. Certainly nothing as big as this, but it looked competent and, and everything else. And, um, and they assured me they could handle a, a large volume of orders that we were due to get on the night. Anyways, it turned out they couldn't. Um, so that was the first learning curve. You know, we had everything in place. The stock arrived, and I think it took them in total three, four weeks to get the orders out. And of course, these customers were waiting for it the next day, as everybody does, especially with Amazon Prime. And yeah, that was not a pleasant experience. But then even worse than that, um, last year I was doing some research online to find out where my products were best marketed. And by this stage, we were selling into Holland and Barrett, which was amazing as well. And I saw them on eBay. And I thought, just like Andy was saying about, you know, who's selling my products on eBay? Like, where is this being distributed? And I had a look at the seller, and I was like, oh, they're in Hounslow. That's where the fulfillment center is. 
And it turned out the staff in the fulfillment centre were stealing the products and selling them on eBay. So that was learning curve number two. And of course, that was a huge problem at that stage. The police got involved, and it was huge. So then I was faced with this problem overnight of you've now got to get all these pallets of stock, thousands of products out into a new fulfillment centre. You've got customers who are waiting for orders and waiting for things to run smoothly. And by this stage, well, I still don't have any staff, so it's just me. So I build the website, I do the marketing. Every part of the business is still just me. And at the time, it was just me. And you can imagine the headache that caused logistically. And I just thought, I don't, I don't know where to begin now looking, because all I'm going to do is the same thing, a Google search. But fortunately, having the Dragons on board meant I could get some good advice. And I spoke to a couple of the other investments, Peter's investments, actually, and said, where are you um, storing at the moment? Who does your fulfillment? And they mentioned another company, which was closer to me in Wigan. And he said, but I'm dying to move to James and James. There's this amazing fulfillment centre. And he actually called you guys the Harrods of Fulfillment. <laughs> and he said, it won't be your cheapest option, but if you want the best. And I was like, yes, I don't care. I just want everything to run smoothly. So the Harrods of Fulfillment sounds good to me. And that's how I started the conversation. And actually, it was Andrea that I spoke to, who I believe isn't here today because she's having to self-isolate, bless her, which is such a shame because I was really looking forward to seeing her again. And I put the call in, and at the time we probably weren't kind of meeting the minimum requirements for James and James to fulfil because I was still a growing business. And Andrea said, yeah, but I saw you on Dragon's Den. And I thought, oh, brilliant, okay, great. So she was like, yeah, we'll take you on. And that was amazing. And the difference, so I, I definitely know the difference between bad fulfilment and good fulfilment. And I think, as Annie mentioned as well, the control port, you know, seeing that as a piece of software, I was like, oh, I can see live stock updates. I don't have to ring the fulfilment center and say, could you get somebody to do a stock count for me? And I can actually see when orders are going out and my customers are gonna get real time updates. And all this was a novelty because the last center certainly didn't have that as an option. And even better, nobody steals from me, which, <laughs> which is also wonderful. So yeah, there was obviously, I had a lot of questions and I came down to the, the old warehouse and had a look around. And just seeing the systems in place, the security in place, everything just made me feel a million times more confident. But I guess that's part of a learning process because I wouldn't have known what I was looking for the first time around, but I definitely know what I'm looking for now. And as we expand and hopefully the business will grow because you know that's the intention and it's been a, a fantastic year. Last month was the best in terms of turnover in sales so far, which is exciting. We're starting to market a lot more now, We're starting to do a lot of advertising because we've kind of got the good foundations in place and I'm confident to do that then I just feel like this is the perfect fit for us to continue growing, not just here in the UK, but also, I don't even want to mention Europe, but America and Canada, Australia, hopefully Europe, if we can kind of get that back to some sort of even keel. Um, Brexit, yeah, causing me nightmares too. And it's just really exciting to be working with a company that I can put my faith in. Um, my life is going to change dramatically as well over the next few months. This is not canapes, this is, <laughs> this is a baby. And so, yeah, three months time, my life is going to change. And actually, I keep, the business partner keeps saying to me, you know, I've got my investors saying, you need to let go. And I, I can't let go of any part of my business. I'm so kind of, um, I'm a bit of a control freak, I guess, but I'm really kind of passionate about the brand. I don't want anyone else doing that job. So to have somebody who I can trust to take the fulfillment side away from me is wonderful because I know the orders are going to come in and they're going to go out and I don't have to worry about that. There'll be a lot of other things I have to worry about this one in particular, but not this part of, of getting orders fulfilled. So for somebody who's still a growing business and at the very early stages really of what I'm trying to do, having the confidence and faith in, in my fulfillment partners is really important. So I'm excited for the next few months and years. Yeah. Thank you, Hannah. Oh, thank you, Hannah. Um, and I think what's even the most exciting bit about that is, is I know you got your product into Holland and Barrett just pre-COVID, and we've not really seen the uptake on sales of that yet, so I know there's a lot more to come. The topic for today is obviously you know, mostly Brexit and slightly COVID, but looking at really, I think, international trade and, and how we manage that. Do we have any questions from the floor to start? If not, I can rattle off a few. It's all clear, yeah. <laughs> well, I think we go to Andy's presentation, um, and thank you for sharing the story of you know of how the company's grown. Lots of challenges there, 
with registration and obviously you've been backed by a large multinational that's got the resources the VAT numbers a lot of that set up but as far as the um, challenges maybe to, to Arnie first you know, what are the challenges that small businesses are facing in going to Europe now Brexit's in place yeah so good slide it up slide it up good evening it's great to be here Great, amazing stories. My, as I said, as we said, my name is Arnie, and I have decided to set up a customs consultancy just in the wake before Brexit, um, because the questions were coming in um, too many. I could count of what shall we do on the first of January, and ever since the questions have been coming in, and um, the challenges I, that we've been seeing are enormous, and they have to do mainly with the fact that we're now out of the single market and the customs union. And that means we trade with Europe like we trade with America, like we trade with China. And that means there's a border that wasn't there before. Before it was Manchester to Paris, like Manchester to London, just go. And now it's, you know, nobody would dream, just go and then hope that we end up in America and it will work out. And it's the same attitude we now have to adopt when we travel across borders. And that means what? It means uh, we have more red tape, we have more paperwork, we have customs declarations to complete at a certain time to write the right things, tell the story of what we're going to send, where we're going to send. We have to deal with the taxes that you will talk about in a moment. Big changes on the 1st of July on, on the VAT, especially for e-commerce retailers. And if you sum all of this up, all this craziness, it comes down to one thing, I would argue. And that is, what do we want our customers to experience? Do we want our customers to experience like it was before? Then we need to do more work. Or do we say, do you know what? They can do their part. I'll do my part. I'm going to export the thing. They are importing the thing. And it'll work itself out. I, I think that's a really interesting question. And I, I know the government's been doing some work to say, you know, we're going to have a special deal. So Susan, uh, maybe I put this to you slightly unfairly, but we've got the one-stop shop uh, and various other registration schemes that are meant to streamline this process. I think the experience from retailers is it's not been as streamlined as we thought. Um, what is the government's kind of approach to it and how should we navigate this? Okay, well, first of all, I, I hope everyone can hear me and I'm, I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. I'm, I'm currently isolated with the, uh, with the COVID situation. Um, so, first of all, I, I can say, I, you know, I very much appreciate businesses at the moment we're facing challenges with COVID and, and with coming out of the EU as well. Um, I work with the Department for International Trade on their export um, export growth side. So in terms of the, what is the government doing, um, I, I will answer that as best I can. But basically, things have been put in place, banks have been put in place, um, support through a, an advisor network that has been put in place. Um, and for those of businesses who are based in the in East Midlands region, they can tap into our network of international trade, trade advisors for support and myself for digital uh, trade support. We've also put in a levelling up a scheme, which has given smaller businesses access to what we call an export academy to help um, skip up and, and learn the trades of uh, exporting. Several webinars, HMRC uh, helpline, a Bayes helpline as well. So there is support there, but I completely understand and appreciate that um, sometimes it's not as easy to navigate, um, and that's why this network of international trade advisors are there to help. Thanks, Susan. Um, that helped. Yeah. And I know there was obviously the. I think it was a, not meant to be a joke, but it turned out you know the government advice was actually goes up overseas and I know that's what we've done actually we've hired more people overseas and less here which is slightly counterintuitive and, and slightly frustrating but Emma you've obviously helped a lot of small companies with the challenge of how they become registered overseas let's not go through the whole every single step you need to for tax I'm sure you can read that on one of your many um, blogs online but what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing that aren't necessarily documented what are the, the difficulties in tax 
So I think the, one of the big difficulties actually is the amount of information out there. So there is a lot of information and I think it's for businesses, it's helping them get into their own supply chain and really getting into the nitty gritty of understanding what they're doing and how that is impacted by all the different rules. So that's really difficult for lots of small businesses because they just don't have the time and the resource to kind of map out their supply chains and understand all the pressure points. So that's a huge exercise in itself. Um, but I think it's uh, understanding the countries which are open to business in terms of if you look into the EU, so places like the Netherlands, places like Belgium, um, so you can get registered there a lot easier, they're open to business from outside the EU and they want to help with facilitations there, so that's um, one of the things that we're helping is using that practical advice to say actually these are the places you should think about if you're going to sort of start and register for VAT and then it, they, they want to work with the customs side, they want to work, you know, their banks and their government are, are all working together for you as business, as some of the other EU member states can be notoriously difficult to work with. And I guess um, back to Arnie's point, you know, this is the same relationship with the US and we think of the US as one country, but actually when you start trading in the US you realise that it's actually like 50 countries or how many states there are, I forget how many now, but is the EU the same thing? Are we actually not dealing with Europe, but we're actually dealing with however many you know, member states there are individually? Yeah, so you've got like general principles that apply across the EU, and that was the same for the UK when we were part of the EU, but each, you know, each different government and tax authority has its own agendas, so there's lots of nuances and rules. Um, you know, for instance, I'm always sort of when people say they want to trade in Italy and then you think that's fine, they're happy to take the VAT, but when you want to get it back, it's a whole different story. So, um, you know, it's, it's knowing those sorts of things that um, are difficult maybe for, for smaller businesses. And so, yeah, the, the EU as a whole is one entity, but each member state is different and it's getting to know your customers, where you, where, which fits your culture, you know, so it's all those sort of things come into play. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, and one thing I wanted to get from today is, you know, I don't want to just look at adversity, because actually, you know, we're here to talk about adversity into opportunity. And, and Theo, I know you work um, a lot across a, a lot of different countries, not just the EU and the US, but, you know, really worldwide as far as payments. Where are those areas of opportunity that you're, you know, the clients you've got are seeing? Yeah, well, I think it's, um, it's obvious that Europe is a, is a difficult not to crack at the moment but um and we've actually seen and not to have a negative spin on this two out of three e-commerce sellers have um, a downward trend year on year um, but to me that sort of talks about there's probably an opportunity there and one that you could um you could exploit through partners like arnie like yourself and i think you need to to really push your service providers for their partner partner network um, I know that a lot of our sellers are struggling to get stock into to European fulfillment centres, for example, very topical and uh, probably something we, you and I should talk about. But um, And a lot of it is down to just uh, um, handlers not wanting to, to move goods because it's so difficult to get it into FBA, for example. So um, I, I would say Europe is not a, sh a closed door, you just need to put a bit more strategic effort into to figuring out how to crack it. Um, outside of that, obviously, the US remains overwhelmingly the, the biggest trading partner for, for UK e-commerce businesses. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not reinventing the wheel to say that's probably stating the obvious, isn't it? But um, uh, outside of that, obviously, you've got um, South America becoming an opportunity. You've got marketplaces like Mercado Libre, which uh, previously you'd never you'd never get your products onto. That that's now opening up, so um, it's not it's not quite as much on your doorstep as it used to be. But there there are opportunities out there, but um, uh, maybe a little bit more difficult. Yeah, and and that's been very interesting for us because a lot of our clients are saying you know the EU, and we were probably we had the challenge actually with and let's bring COVID into this slightly. You know, last year we doubled the size of the company with COVID. And, and the idea of having to open an EU fulfillment centre whilst trying to go through peak and doing that was something we tried to put off and obviously that's had a slight negative effect for a bit slow but we now actually have um, for the last month we've been trading in Europe with that and a lot of clients have said that's great you know let's get product to Europe and then you kind of go oh we've got to have a VAT number we've got to have one stop shop we've got to have uh, and then the kind of there's still there's still a list but there are less people kind of as keen to do that and I guess the question is for smaller companies, and, and Hannah's a, a fantastic example, you know, of a, a one, 
a one lady band as it were that's you know really grown a company and that's quite a lot of time and investment to understand and register for all that complexity and Arnie how are companies like yourselves you know are there people like you can you help small companies you know is it cost effective yeah I mean the, so I'm, I'm called the customs geek right because I like I love this stuff classification <laughs> origin you know I get like oh my god I can source this duty free from Ghana wonderful but I'm actually not having any business in Ghana anyway the, the point is we, we really don't have a choice though right so if we say the UK is not sorry GB is not enough and we want to experiment and, and see what the Irish market offers our, our language neighbors we have no choice so the option is not can I afford it but how do I make it happen and therefore of course um, my business grows when you guys grow logically the more customs declaration I help you make the more you're gonna sell but the one thing that won't change is the fact that now we need to make these customs declaration we need to geek up and everybody will grow faster if you geek up a little with me and I'll be there to hold your hand and guide you through and either we do this bespoke or we use modern technology to make it happen but customs classification is awesome <laughs> I think there's a very different perspective from the one I've had um, on how that works and, and, and Susan I'm sure you hear this a lot from small companies around the complexity and I know you know frustration we have here is that there's now two different types of ERI number for Northern Ireland and that seems like it kind of breaks every computer system and able to write custom code for uh, is there any simplification expected with Europe or, you know do you think where we are now you know it's the help and advice to deal with where we are or do you feel like you know, there is possibly some respite on the way. What, what, what I would like to say is that I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic about Europe still. British goods and uh, services are very uh, sought after all over the world, including Europe. Um, yes, we are dealing with 27 different countries now in the EU, rather than one entity. Um, and yes, we are experiencing challenges at the moment, but that said, there is still a lot of opportunity in Europe, and still a lot of online buying. Um, and if if we can kind of guide businesses through these dark woods at the moment, then bring it on because I I do think that that there is a lot of potential still to be had in Europe and and beyond, of course. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just turn to the floor and see if there's any other questions from the floor. I'm sure some people have got some burning questions on. AJ, what's your view of the world? Well, if I'm a small retailer and I, my customers come from anywhere in the world, at the moment um, I'd love to fulfil those orders, but I'm a small customer. I don't want to pay a lot of money to, to send goods wherever. It's as if everything's stacked up against me. The, the, you've talked about what's a simple route, who do you talk to, whatever, but the, there isn't a simple solution. And, and I suppose my point is, is there enough will to sort that out? And what's the right route? Who's the right person to talk to to sort that out? So I can sell. Yeah, it's a good question. Emma, do you know who is the right person to talk to? <laughs> well, it's, yeah, you're, you're right. It is difficult because there's so many different factors um, that sort of are impacting but I think what's important is talking to somebody who understands your business so and that's I think what's most important from our perspective as an advisor is you just giving people theory is no use anymore because we're well into the thick of it so I think you know who you choose to to speak to but I'd look for people who want to understand your business so they really want to know and what's important to you commercially because those kind of people will then be invested like Arna says like like we are we are invested in watching our clients grow um, and I think that's that's the most important quality you can get the advice from all sorts of different places but it's finding people who understand your business and probably you know want to sort of watch that investment and watch you you grow into the right way and even warn you off from maybe doing things that aren't right and looking for the right kind of opportunities that are right for your business, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, and Arnie, we were talking over a, a miniature beef Yorkshire earlier. And, um, it was very delicious. It was, it was very good. But, you know, I was saying actually, you know, 
UK companies kind of cut off a little bit from Europe, it's a bit harder, but you know, the, the world is still a big place, there's lots of opportunity out there. And I was asking about, you know, the, the other way around, you know, Europe's a big place, are European retailers, do they still want to sell into the UK? And yes, of course, of course. It's, uh, and, and as um, Susan said, um, our products are well sought after, valued and respected and needed in the European Union. So it's not like we fall, fell off the, you know, the cliff of the earth right now. We're there, we just have a bit more work to do than everybody else. But of course, before I answer your question, this is a session about opportunity, and I love the fact that you bring opportunity in here because, and as Susan also points out, we've got to remember that A, we've got the whole world in our hands. Where, where does that come from? Anyway, um, and get this, even if you're a small enterprise and you're growing, if you put away, if you do the work together with the advisors, with the Gov website, with all the resources that are available to you, and you learn customs, and you learn that, you've learned it then, then it's good for Europe, but then it's good for America too, and for China too, and for Australia too. And then when the government does these fantastic trade deals, once you've geeked out a little bit, well then the world is your oyster. And then you do what our examples, our case studies showed, you grow your business beyond and you don't need to do the customs learning again and again. So we, in a way, have a bit of an advantage. And the final point, and then I stop, I promise. The, um, the Europeans want our business, and the Europeans will do everything they can to get into our market. And I know this because I'm 50% European. <laughs> so, no, that's, that's a, a great point there. Uh, and I, just talking from my own experience, so we went to the US five, six years ago and started up a US fulfillment center, and we probably made the mistake that pretty much most companies make when you go abroad, which is you go there and go, yeah, we're going to go to another country, and you go, oh, actually, culturally quite hard, a little bit difficult, currency is different, to kind of sell differently, and it, it, you know, it, it probably took us three years to really find our feet, and now the last two years, you know, it's really started to fly, but it's taken a while to get there. And so, so Theo, you know, you're working with a lot of companies in multi-currency and, and for them it's easy with your you know to be able to add six ten currencies in a day but realistically you know, when's the right time to start looking at you know seriously looking at overseas markets because it's very easy to get sucked into it too early uh, good good point um, I think <clears throat> we've seen increasingly that um, a lot of smaller size e-commerce sellers are now just um, sort of head in the sand which is how I describe their strategy there's the the barriers to to selling in Europe are so hard, but surely they'll get better because it used to be really easy and that. But so I'm just going to wait and focus on the UK market. And there's only so many people that can focus on the UK market before you think, well, actually, that's going to become quite a competitive, difficult arena to sell in. So um, when is the right time to sell abroad? I don't know. I, there are not that many barriers with people like yourselves, like like the company I work for, World First, where we. Uh, facilitate overseas payments and collections. Uh, the tech is out there. We, we're not we're not in 2010 anymore. You can you can get really good solutions. Um, to, to your question uh, earlier, you can get um, sort of institutional level um, support from from currency brokers, that sort of thing, um, for, for the small and medium enterprise. So. Um, I, I wouldn't say you need to, to sort of conquer the domestic market before looking overseas. It's not, it's not that big a, big a barrier, but that, that's my opinion. And everyone's probably got a slightly different slant on it. So. Anyone else on the panel got a, a different answer to that question? Or? Emma? <laughs> Um, no, I think I was lucky enough to get my own mic. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, no, I would agree. I think I, I, I think that it's scary because it, it's just so new and it's so different. And most people haven't had to deal with a lot of the things we're having to deal with the back complexities and customs for, um, you know, however many 30 odd 40 years. But, you know, it is just a case of becoming familiar with it and, you know, and just making it part of your everyday business. And, 
investing in, like I say, investing in a bit of that training and getting to know, is, it isn't that difficult. I mean, I shouldn't really say that because obviously this is why I get paid, but, you know, eventually people, it'll become part of everyday business, you know, and the same way it was when we joined the EU, you know, for businesses had to deal with that then. So I think, and you're right, there is so much technology to assist, you know, whether that's customs or VAT, there's amazing people out there who don't charge a lot of money to automate things. So yeah, automation and tech is an awesome point that that can really be a good friend as well. And Susan, just to put the question to you, as far as the, the DIT helping companies go overseas, is there a sort of a size or a threshold you say, you know, this is the point you need to start looking or, or you would say to smaller companies, actually, you know, the UK is still a big market, actually, you know, you should be investing in the UK first. I would say with, with e-commerce particularly, you know, there are no physical trade borders or barriers. Um, so you can set up a website or set up marketplaces and you've got access to potentially the whole world. And businesses do start to see sales coming through their websites from overseas. But it's the difference between being reactive to that and then being proactive. So if sales are coming in from a particular market, some pretty good sales, then that's probably the time to start getting proactive. And, and my advice there would be to optimise, localise and analyse for, for those markets and create a plan for um, getting more traction in those markets. Um, and, and again, with, with, with e-commerce there, you know, those sales will come in. But imagine if you did localise and optimise how much more those sales would come in. Um, don't try and conquer the whole world at once. Do your, definitely do your research. Um, even with the states, yes, we have to see it as 50 different countries, if you like, and yes, we speak the same language. However, there are 4,000 or so different terminologies between British English and American English, so optimising and localising your keywords for how people find you on your website, for example, Example, is important as well. So don't think just because they speak the same language, don't they, it's going to be easy, an easy market uh, to go into because, again, it needs planning. There's something like over uh, 194 countries in the world, and yes, there are similarities between some of them, but actually they are different countries that do different things in different ways, diff different languages, cultures, buying trends, and all that needs to be planned out, uh, and the support is out there in order to do that. All right, thanks, Susan. Yeah, I think planning is obviously a, a key part, and actually, I, I really like that point that it's about waiting till there's a pull. There's no point just saying I'm going to go to this country. You know, you should wait until you've got a certain level of of revenue from that country that says this is the next destination for me. This is the place to go. Um, I'm going to pick on, on Claude, who's our, our Chief Customer Officer, who's responsible for looking after the 400 or so clients. Asked. What's the biggest question you're being asked currently? <laughs> There's probably more than one, actually, but, <laughs> but it, it is around the, just the confusion of, of what, what they need to do, sort of picking up on, on AJ's point. You know, I'm a small retailer, I sell whatever. This is, this is complicated. I'm not a customs geek like you, your words, not mine, but... Customer. <laughs> um, and the, the, so, that, so there is some confusion and, and what do I need to do? How do I do this? And, and it's, it, it is complicated. And as you said, you just, once you get used to it, it it's okay. But it's, I think a lot of people have, have not have left it to the last minute to, to read up on it because everybody's busy. Everyone, everyone's got things to do. Everyone's got stuff to sell, right? And so... Um, it, that's probably the biggest question. What what do I need to do? And that's and that is actually quite crazy if you think about all the gov.uk times we we are googling gov gov.uk and we're seeing do this do this do this. There is too much. <laughs> now I'm not, I'm not saying this is not a criticism, but um, <laughs> but there is for everything there is something that gov. That UK will tell you, and nothing applies to you. It feels like, so the end result will be that we need to sit together, as Emma says, and says, "Okay, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And based on your business model, what you want to do and you want to achieve, let's do a plan of action. Let's not overcomplicate the world. 
the top three things we're going to do right now, and then this is what we're going to do next month. It's, but as I say, if you are an entrepreneur and you're building a business, Brexit is not going to stop you. Come on. No, that's true. But I think that that experience you're talking about is vital. I know when we went to the US and I started reading about all the legislations and you were sitting there thinking, oh, perhaps we should give this one a miss. And, and the reality is you start speaking to them and say, oh, well, you know, technically you have to register for this. But you know what? Unless you're doing, you know, more than $100,000 a year, you can leave that for three months. And, you know, there's certain things that, that you kind of have to do, but you can kind of avoid for a bit. And, and actually, you know, there's, there's a simpler way. And the journey isn't that complex, but I think, you know, because it's so different in so many places, that it's understanding what that journey is. So who do we need to sit down with? Is it, is it the Department of International Trade? Is it an advisor like yourself? Is it a tax advisor? You know, who is, is there one person or is it actually having a, a meeting with everyone in the same room? Yes, go on, Susan, please. Um, I would say it was a, it, it would be a, a mixture of, of all of those and, and above, all of the above. Um, so certainly within DIT, the uh, network of international trade advisors, they almost account manage a company and will tap into Army's expertise, Emma's expertise and World First expertise as and when needed and signpost businesses to that support. But as a, a, a first port of call, perhaps the DIT that can get your ducks in a row and work out a plan with you and then bring in that expert help as and when needed. Okay, thank you. I don't know what the others are I would agree as well. And I would say I think that works on the other side as well because one challenge I think I see a lot is I mean, obviously, some of you might be very small. Maybe it's just you. But for people who have teams, so it often the dealing with Brexit and especially customs, no one knows where to put it. And often you have maybe one person in finance who's trying to make sense of all this. But actually, if they've got the logistics guy in and they've got the sales guys in and then you all get together, that's when suddenly it all starts unlocking because everybody has a bit of knowledge about moving your goods or dealing with that customer. So I think I definitely agree. And it also works internally. Make sure you've got the right team of people because move, you know, supply chains and moving your goods isn't one person's area of expertise in a business. And maybe the one... <laughs> Go ahead, Lee, first. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted. I was just going to say international trade is a massive landscape. And, you know, we, we all work together to help businesses get where they want to be. The, the only thing I would add to that is sometimes, of course, you don't have the luxury of, of you know, having a plan because it, the goods are stuck at the port, right? And they need to be released. In which case, you might want to have a customs manager on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, and I, and I think we've definitely seen that internally. The challenges we've had with, with Brexit have been compounded by, I think, um, I mean, Brexit officially happened the 1st of January, but the legislation wasn't kind of officially published until about the third week of January. So there's a, been a few black holes and a few couriers are still kind of implementing stuff they don't admit it, but I think there's some people still implementing bits in the background without saying, and that's causing a lot of what looks like Brexit problems, but actually probably IT problems in, in other people in the supply chain. Um, and just drawing to the end of this, but looking at opportunity outside of just Brexit, you know, COVID has changed the world as we know it, and there's a lot of opportunity. E-commerce has boomed. Um, some parts of e-commerce has boomed more than others. Some will go back to the high street, but some has been a definite change. Theo, from the, the clients you work with, has there been a general trend? Are there certain industries, if you're thinking of, you know, if you're running a, a portfolio of small companies or you're, you're thinking of starting a company, are there certain industries you're sitting there going, you know, don't, don't go there or, you know, this is the way forward? Uh, good question. Um, we saw, um, so we're, we're privileged because we see sales, well, not sales data, but sort of um, <coughs> revenue data for um, over 3,000 UK e-commerce businesses and it's really interesting to see who's done well and who hasn't but I think in this this year particularly um, you live and die by your supply chain um, along with football coming home 2021 is definitely a um, year of the supply chain blocked Suez Canal shipping containers going through the roof um, so may, maybe not it's maybe how well you operate your business how well you manage your supply chain um, um, certainly heard some interesting stories about businesses that that uh, didn't do well, but um, probably won't dwell on dwell on those. Um, 
But no, I don't think I don't think um, it's too specific on a category. We've seen an overwhelming boom across e-commerce. I know that's not a particularly insightful uh, response, but it's fa the fact of the matter, um, we've yeah we've seen really um, strong growth across multiple categories. Um, maybe, maybe you maybe you've got some interesting insight in that, given that you're you're handling the packages. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, we've seen uh, various stages in it. So there's the kind of pajamas and sort of be beauty went down, didn't it? And no one wanted to wear makeup to sit at home on their video calls. So it was, you know, can I buy some comfy pajamas? Can I buy a blanket? Um, can I buy some moisturizer? I think, you know, Hannah's probably a particularly good area of the market with sort of, you know, natural organic skincare. I think people have spent a lot of their beer money probably on, on health care um, to feel more you know, rejuvenated at home, sat at home. I think home office supplies, I'm sure people that sell swivel chairs are doing very well. Uh, I know Argos and Ikea have been sold out of flat pack office furniture for people who are trying to make their office less back-breaking than sat on a beanbag um, in the corner of the bedroom. Um, and, and Emma, you've obviously got a broad range of clients as well. Are there any that have actually pivoted that you know of, that have actually, you know, they've, they've been in this industry and it's started to change? You know, much like our company, we started off with the idea of being a tech company, turned up being an operations company, now starting to go back to developing tech again. Have uh, there been companies that have just completely changed their business model from COVID? Yeah, I, I, we've definitely seen um, there's been a sort of a whole new wave of work this year, which is the, d the new way of delivering something traditional. So that's what we found because, like you say, suddenly people have realised how easy it is to access information or goods or services via um, a tech platform. So we've done a lot of work with around um, sort of education, tourism, and um, as well in the sort of medical space, where suddenly there's a whole new world of delivery straight to the consumer via a tech platform. So um, that's been so interesting because it's really old law you know, legislation written for this world that was never imagined. So that is fascinating as well. And yeah, really changing the way they deliver things. That is an interesting point, actually. Uh, just as a, a complete sort of interesting fact, the, the Digital Communications Act was signed in 2000, which meant you could electronically sign something. But it was only last year that our lawyers actually allowed us to digitally sign something without requesting it. So there's progress for you. It's taken 21 years <laughs> since the legislation, um, but we can now ease sign stuff. Um, any final questions? I've got one around the ideal world for a customer or for a client, you know, I've got a business I want to, so the ideal world for me is one currency, no back laws around the world that are different and no customs issues. You're going to put this light out of business. <laughs> Do you ever see that happening and in what time scale? I, I, I think there might be a, a, possibly a too, too many people with too many fingers in pies to allow that to ever happen because there'd be a lot of business that would be uh, marginalised by that utopia. Any other thoughts on that? I mean, it is the first time a country's now made Bitcoin their official currency, so, you know, we are... Well, then we're going to text that. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, that, that's it. <laughs> There's the optimism. Yeah. Yeah. Different currencies, that can't happen. Yeah. I like to, you know. But I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's interesting, <laughs> you know. The government, yeah. the government <laughs> sort it out, not companies. And I think it's an interesting comment, actually, because there's a world of opportunity, which is, you know, why are we don't have, you know, a single currency? Why don't we have no regulations? Why don't we trade internationally? And the reality is, I think, is, you know, the experts are saying it's never going to happen. I don't know if that's because we've got too many pessimists on the panel um, <laughs> or whether that's just the cold, hard world of the reality we live in. Well, some countries are trying to harmonise their currency and, and, and do away with um, you know, different regulation. We know what we call this construction of 27 countries. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Nan. And uh, well, look, perhaps we should end on that note before we, we go down to the politics and further. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, some of the team are going to offer tours of the facility that anyone's interested in seeing behind the glass window. Um, thank you much, Susan, joining remotely. Appreciate the, uh, the difficulty with that. And, and to the rest of the panel um, here, thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. <laughs>